Hi, everyone. Before we get started, I just wanted to announce if you need interpretation in Spanish, um, please use this link or uh, dial in number. Si necesitas interpretación en español, por favor, unanse en este enlace o llama a 408-638-0968 y el código es 899-7940. A dos seis setenta y seis. Una vez más, uh, el número es cuatro cero ocho seis tres ocho cero nueve setenta y ocho. El código es ocho nueve nueve setenta y nueve cuarenta y seis veinte y seis. 76. And we'll have Nicholas Thompson open our program with a tribute. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nicholas Thompson, and tonight I'll be representing Wings of Love Ministries in East Oakland. Um, I'm here because there are a whole lot of challenges the youth are facing in the community. One of those challenges being the school to prison pipeline, which you will hear more about later from our other youth leaders. Um, but right now, I would like to open up with a moment of silence for our loved ones, George Floyd, Nia Wilson, Stephen Clark, and Breonna Taylor, and all those who have lost unnecessarily too soon. So let's just take a moment of silence. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right now, the world needs healing, love, and so tonight I'll be singing a song for my Christian faith to open up to open up tonight town hall and pay tribute to our loved ones, including George Floyd and Nia Wilson, and so many more who were unnecessarily killed by the state. So here is my song of hope. Just 
your presence flowing deep within And as the deer is for the water, so my soul is alone. When thirsty God, you the living water, and my soul is alone. And as the deer is for so 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 you for listening to my song of hope so please hold on to the hope and fight for change um now you'll be hearing from soan amari from the yemeni american youth center who will review the town who will review the town hall agenda thank you thank you nicholas that was so beautiful and i hope that it resonated with you all as much as it did with me good evening all and welcome to our youth town hall today's town hall is hosted in partnership with the amazing youth leaders and community-based organizations in Oakland. On behalf of these organizations and youth collaborators and myself, thank you for being present today with us. My name is Silvana Mori. I'm a senior at UC Berkeley majoring in sociology. Today I'm representing the Yemeni American Youth Center located in Oakland. The Yemeni American Youth Center aims to improve the lives and quality of lives of Yemeni youth by providing them with resources and tools and by aiding them academically as well as socially. Now, today in this town hall, we will be discussing alternatives to policing, the school to prison pipeline, more specifically. The school to prison pipeline is a phenomenon where students are pushed out of schools and into the system. In other words, it is a process of criminalizing the youth through disciplinary processes and consequences that put students in direct contact with law enforcement and indirect contact with the system. 
The main concern here is how do we move students away from feeling unsafe when going to school and move them closer to an environment where administrators and teachers reach out to them and help them guide them to success? How do we push students towards success rather than farther down the criminal justice system? Today we'll be discussing alternatives to this policing system and disciplinary processes that are failing our youth on a daily basis. And because the youth are the driving force in that change, today's town hall will be completely youth led as well as youth moderated. The youth who will be speaking today are here to project their voices and their concerns with volume and we are here to listen to them. Change will take place when the youth are able to be a part of the discussion, share their thoughts, and when they're provided with a platform just like this one to express what they're thinking. So today the youth will be the ones framing the discussion as they share their stories, testimonies, and experiences. Today we're not just going to be talking, but rather we're going to be discussing real-time issues and challenges that students are facing on a daily basis. And they're going to propose alternatives and demand changes be made. We need commitments to be made by those in charge. We need commitments to be made by those in positions to make changes happen and meet our demands. The three main demands we're going to be discussing today are one, transparency. We need open communication. Where are the funds going? Two, culture change. How do we embed restorative justice and how do we embed social emotional learning approaches into schools? How do we train teachers and administrators to listen to students rather than push them farther down the system and push them away? Three, program development. How do we develop and enhance students' learning through programs, through investing in them, investing in their communities, investing in their education and believing in them? Now, please note, if you'd like to ask a question for the town hall, you, will, you can text the nine-digit code 450-410-464 to the phone number 72855. Again, the, the, number, the nine-digit code is 450-410-464 and the phone number is 72855. By dialing that in, you'll receive a link to participate in this exchange and discussion. Now, without further delay, I'm going to hand the mic or open up the space to our next youth leader, our next youth speaker, Griffin Castillo. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me and the youth in this space. Like all my peers have mentioned already, it's youth that hold things up and youth that bring that fresh perspective to really drive that change. So thank you, Savan, for introducing me and opening the space to me. Thank you, Nicholas, for the song. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, my name is Griffin Castillo, um, and I've grown up in Oakland all my life. I'm from the hills and have had access to resources and opportunities that I know many of my peers and my brothers and my sisters and my family members don't have in Oakland. Um, and that's part of what drives me to be here. Right, and, and, and the deeper you dive into Oakland, the more and more you realize that it's something that really does impact everybody, right? People are being pushed out of school and taken from their homes and denied opportunities and then labeled as criminals and, and prevented from having those resources that everybody needs, like a place to grieve and a place to be and a place to really live and grow as a person. Um, and for me, uh, one way that I that I deal with that, that process of, of, of grieving for, for loved ones is through music. Um, and I want to share something that I'd written today about my experience with, with diving into these things and, and realizing the impact of them on myself and community. Here we go. Seems the more and more I think it seems the more and more I cry because I've been losing all my friends and you don't even tell me why. Where'd they go? Where'd you put them? Why'd you take them from my heart? Where they been? Where they going? You must have planned it from the start. There's no the pain you caused. I know you must be hurting so it. Don't excuse the things you've done, but at least I understand why you lock my friends away instead of looking in our eyes and choose to push us all away instead of watching mothers cry. And if you shot down and you listen, you would see us as we are. We just humans grieving, crying, wishing, praying to the stars so please just sit and listen put your weapons to the side let my youngins be in peace and follow us into the light someday we will find freedom from the fear inside our heart let these words inside your body and some love inside your heart because it's not worth it to be so critical please just let my people breathe in just let us go and maybe then we can walk together to the promised land we'll walk Side by side, someday marching hand in hand. <laughs> yeah, and for me, like it's it's about dealing with that process, right? That that struggle and that trauma, and really sitting in that grief and acknowledging because it's real. And when we don't sit with it and we don't acknowledge it, we deny our youth that experience to really grieve and to grow and to make those changes. 
And restorative justice was a place for me to really dig into that and tap into my own experience and be able to share that. So please be here to listen to the youth because we got this. <laughs> so thank you all for being here. And with that, I'll pass it on to a peer of mine, Leanna Parrish. Thank you. Hello, thank you everyone for having me here. My name is Leanna Parrish, and today I'm going to talk about how mental health and trauma is associated with the school to prison pipeline. I additionally have a slideshow, so can you please share it? That's great. I would like to first ask you all, why are students going to prison? Two reasons are expulsion and suspension. Students who are suspended or expelled from school not only miss critical days of instruction, but they are permanently stigmatized as problem students which disrupts their academic progress. As students who are suspended or expelled are more likely to be held back a grade or drop out of school. The racial bias in school discipline contributes to the achievement gap between whites and students of color. Three other reasons are in-school arrest, the foster care system, and unemployment. The prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until about the age of 25. It deals with cognitive skills, emotional expression, problem solving, sexual behaviors, and the ability to communicate. Next slide, please. Being taught lessons in school instead of being criminalized is very important. Some kids are still getting older and having trouble, you know, making decisions, and they might not have role models in their life to help them with that. I have many male black friends that speak about witnessing murders as early as the age of 12. They witness their family members getting shot and killed, causing them to feel like a gun is the only thing that can protect them and they must have a name for themselves. There is a huge stigma around masculinity in the black community. I used to be friends with a boy that had a good life and great opportunities, yet he still insisted on doing fraudulent things like scamming. He had a lot of things going on at home and constantly felt like he had to prove himself to others around him. I genuinely believe that he was narcissistic and he did not have a healthy way of anger expression. The reality is that they're facing trauma and they're not educated enough to understand things like PTSD. They may know about it, but not, but be blind that they're being affected. As you can reference the slide, according to the Washington Post, Oakland students only have one school nurse for every 1,750 students and one counselor for every 600 students. The recommended ratio is 250 to one by, according to Ed Source. When I attended public school, I saw my counselor one time. She never even pronounced my name correctly. Many students didn't even know that we had a counselor that you could see. My counselor unnecessarily suggested that I needed medication when I told her how I was feeling. When I entered high school, I attended private school. I was much different experience and I met with my counselor more often. She had fewer students and genuinely cared about my mental health and I was able to receive therapy for some of the issues that I was having. It helped me to think about my actions and better control the way I express anger. If students seek help, this can help them express their emotions better in a classroom setting. Better counseling made me a better student. However, counseling is not the only problem in the school to prison pipeline. We need better training for teachers. I had a teacher that would send me out unnecessarily. She would call me out in front of class, hover over me when I was doing my work, and when I was asked questions, she would answer me sarcastically. Being sent out made me miss work and ultimately conditioned me into believing that the teacher did not care about my education or my well-being. If it was another situation or another student, they might have taken the route of not even going to class anymore. If they didn't go to class, they would get suspended. And if they did not attend school, they're more likely to be criminalized due to the masculinity problem and the trauma that they were facing, therefore finding themselves in the school to prison pipeline. Next slide, please. Here's what I think are some solutions. I believe that we need better training for teachers, more public school funding, so there is a better student to counselor ratio, thus creating better relationships and less of a heavy load on counselors. And additionally, we need to educate minorities and other students that mental health is a serious issue. There are so many resources out there and some of them don't know the route or the steps to take to get to those resources. Additionally, we need to have mandatory check-ins to make sure everything's okay in their life and things like that. So thank you for listening, and I really appreciate being here in this opportunity. And I would like to pass it off to Rasan Smith. Thank you, Leanna. Good evening. My name is Rasan Smith. I'm an income, incoming senior at San Leandro High School, but I am from and live in East Oakland, and I'm here on behalf of African American Male Achievement. 
Today, I stand in solidarity with the youth of Oakland to discuss the much needed change we have to see in our community. I will be speaking on two topics today, one of which is school to prison pipeline, along with police brutality, which I experienced personally myself. When it comes to school to prison pipeline, I don't want to take the angle of breaking down statistics because I'm sure we're all aware that it exists and it shouldn't at all. And if you're not aware, I'll be the first person to tell you it does fully through. It goes back to when I went to Montero Middle School in Oakland, California, and I experienced my peers along with myself be prejudged by a teacher on the very first day of school, just on the color of our skin, assuming that we'll be class clowns sent out a lot, not have any input to the class. We don't really care when we did. I've seen how a referral that is supposed to be given to a student for being quote unquote defiant can unconsciously eat at a student's morale and drive to want to go to school. That pink slip may only be a piece of paper, but it has the power to determine if a student believes they could be something in life or they even have the potential to be great. It is essential that every teacher sees the light in any and every student, no matter of race, ethnic background, religion, sexuality, etc. because every student has the light. If they don't believe they have the light, I feel like the youth will be lost and we're all aware that the youth is the future. We're living proof. When it comes to police brutality, it's a burden that I have feared since I was in the sixth grade. But here I am now, six years later, and the burden has only gotten bigger. It's a shame that I woke up one morning and I watched a man by the name of George Floyd be killed for 10 minutes straight on video. George Floyd was a black man. I am a black man. And he's not the first name. He was just another one that is unfortunate to a long list of names. When I seen the video, I was in outrage and I knew I had to do something. So I took the initiative to participate in many peaceful protests in cities such as Oakland and San Leandro. I hate that I had to see peaceful protests turn very violent, not on the protesters' behalf. I've seen police come, throw tear gas, shoot people with rubber bullets, mace people in massive groups, hundreds of people just standing there just trying to protest for what they believe is right for the essential way of just living life. I myself was shot in the hand by a rubber bullet. I came home and to my mom and I showed her and she grabbed me, she held me close. And I sensed that she was lucky that I was alive. No woman nor anybody should ever have to deal with that, have that burden about their child. Being a child have to deal with that at the age of 17 and below and older, it's not right. I stand here to say that I will fight for every cause because the time for change is long overdue. And me being part of the youth, I'm going to advocate for my people and stand in solidarity with anybody who stands in solidarity with us. Oakland, California is my home. Me being shot in the hand in Oakland, California by a rubber bullet shows that the things that we see on social media is not too far away. It's right here happening every day. Just not everything makes the news. And I want to thank everybody for giving me the time to speak to them. And I would like to pass it to my fellow youth leader by the name of Ashanti Silva. Thank you, Rasan. I just want to say thank you guys for allowing me to be here. Thank you to Griffin, Liana, and Rasan for those powerful testimonies. Um, my name is Ashanti Silva. I am from 83rd. Today I'm representing Higher Ground, which is a youth-led organization in East Oakland that provides after-school programming, career-to-college workforce programming, health clinics at schools, professional development, and service learning experiences. Right now, we're gonna hear from several youth leaders, such as Siglatli Castro from Vision Quilt, Soraya Shabazz from We Lead Hours, and Jack Palma from Oakland Police Youth Advisory Council. Now, with further ado, I'd like to pass it over to my fellow youth leader, Siglatli. Hi, my name is Siklali, and I'm here to represent Vision Quilt. I have a slideshow. Um, Vision Quilt's motto is together we can prevent gun violence.
Vision Quilt's mission is to empower communities to create solutions to gun violence through the power of art and inclusive dialogue. Next slide, please. I am a sophomore at Lighthouse Community Charter School. After one of the students in our school was killed, our middle school teachers created a three-month program to study the causes and potential solutions to gun violence. Vision Quilt was invited to be part of this program. This program involves every seventh grader. Since 2016, over 250 students have participated. I am one of the seven members of the team council that advises Vision Quilt's part of the program. Our three month program is done through our math and humanities classes and in our mentoring sessions. We always read literature, study gun laws, national and local statistics, toxic masculinity, write op-eds and hear from community members who have either experienced gun violence or are working to prevent it. Vision Quilt is designed in our curriculum for our school and they help each student make an 18 by 24 inch fabric panel to amplify his or her vision and call to action. Students are always given social and emotional support as they study the roots of gun violence. Bullying, racism, depression, poverty, police, police brutality, domestic violence, access to guns, and etc. At the end of the year, students design and lead a hands-on exhibition for the Oakland community. My year, 400 people showed up to see our exhibition while the Warriors were playing for the national NBA playoff title. The Warriors won. Our teachers and Vision Quilt help us process our feelings and thoughts and challenge us to think about what we can do to stop this violence. Making my Vision Quilt panel helped me paint and draw away my anxiety that I face every day in East Oakland. As a person of color, education is not normalized, but violence is. This program helped me realize this can and should change. Making my Vision Quilt panel helped me share an important message about gun violence that promotes conversations around the U.S. Our vision call panels have been shut down at Oakland City Hall, in community centers, libraries, and schools, and schools in the East Bay, as well as across the United States. They are also worn vigils and marches for social justice. Vision Quilt has worked with incarcerated youth from Alameda County, custom designing those sessions with key partners to support those students in making responsible choices. Following the death of a Fremont High School, high school student this January, Vision Quilt worked with key partners, Fremont High students, staff, the Coalition for Violence Prevention and the Department of Violence Prevention to host a student-led restorative justice community conversation and call to action. Vision Quilt is based on partnerships, including Attitudinal Heating Connection, West Open Middle School, Brick Impact Academy, Youth Alive, Youth Alive Catholic Charities East Bay, Violence Prevention Con Coalition, Oakland Frontline Healers, and Survivor Organizations. Because of all the racial disparity in our country, 80% 80% of the current incarcerated population in the U.S. did not finish high school. That is why Vision Quote and all its partner organizations stress the need to fund in-school and after-school programs and mentor youth academically and emotionally. Lighthouse School and Vision Quilt received an Innovation Award from the John Legend Foundation and the National Writing Project, one of 10 sites in the entire U.S. for a program called Addressing Gun Violence, Creating Visionaries, Storytellers, and Community Activists. This is our call to action. Offer Lighthouse and Vision Quilt curriculum to other Oakland, Oakland Unified Schools, promote and fund restorative justice practices in all schools, promote and fund curriculum that empowers students to grow socially and emotionally, and establish team councils in every school to amplify student voices and influence decision makers. Next slide. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about our work, and now I pass it on to Soraya. Hi, I'm Soraya Shabazz. I go to Bishop O'Dowd High School and I'm an intern for We Lead Hours. We Lead Hours' main mission is to help disadvantaged youth realize their full potential and live up to their abilities through positive team building, educational and service oriented activities. We Lead Hours will always provide youth with continual support through our mentoring and leadership development programs. Next slide, please. 
Mentoring on the Fly is one of We Lead Our's mentoring slash leadership programs. This program provides inner city youth to participate in this scholarship mentoring program that focuses on civic engagement, career exploration, college preparation, life skills, and public editing. This is all done through group mentoring with a variety of professionals. Next slide. We The Scenario Podcast brings on business professionals, entrepreneurs, medical professionals, and so many more amazing individuals who are doing great work in their fields to talk about their journey to achieving success. These interviews give youth a chance to hear from people that look like them and give them the motivation to go out and achieve that same success. Webcore, which is a construction contractor corporation, is partnering with We Lead Ours to host a webinar on careers and trade. This webinar will help provide information for youth slash young adults to have just to give a glimpse of a path they may want to venture in to help pay for their education or as an alternative option for kids who can't afford college. There will be people who work in this field who will talk about their journeys and give the audience an idea of what it's like to work in that specific trade. Because I'm an intern for We Lead Ours, I was able to help plan this webinar and have been able to have my voice be heard and help the Webcore team give them perspective as a young person of how this webinar can be very appealing to my fellow young people. And I'm very excited to see how this turns out. Next slide, please. Overall, We Lead Ours is doing a lot of great work. This organization is a great example of why we need to invest in programs like this. This is because without them, there will be a lot more kids out there who feel like they have nothing to fall back on, which can lead to trouble. Thank you. Now I will pass it on to Jackie. Hello, everyone. What's up? What's up? Good evening, everyone. My name is Jackie Palmer. I'm a young adult leader of the Oakland Police Community Youth Leadership Council, or the OPC YLC, as we call it for short. The OPC YLC was envisioned by the Oakland youth who came together after Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson back in 2015. As a way to bring youth voice to the public safety decision making tables, the OPC YLC helps to interrupt the school to prison pipeline by creating and supporting the implementation of policy changes. As we work to create alternatives to policing, we also need to improve OPD practices in the meantime. OPC YLC is working hard to implement the following recommendations. Youth being on the hiring panel for police candidates, know your rights workshops for young people in and out of school-based settings, youth co-lead training for officers on adolescents' brain development, youth engagement, and best practices for how officers should engage young people differently on how they engage adults. Another project I help lead is the creation of a 21st century alternative education hub at 1025 Second Avenue across the street from Laney College. This project helps interrupt the school to prison pipeline by offering full services, wraparound programming, career technical education, and transition age youth housing for youth who we know require alternative pathways to post-secondary success, whether it's college or career. The vision itself was crafted by voices of young men who were detained at Camp Sweeney in the summer of 2017. They dared to imagine what kind of support our community could offer them, what, would, what, what stopped them from becoming victims of a somatic injustice, systematic injustice. I am honored to help make this vision come to life. And we welcome community support as we move this project forward. Thank you for your time. Now we'll pass this on to my fellow youth leader, Jonathan. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jonathan Piper II. I'm from, I graduated from Skyline High School, class of 2019. Um, while I was at Skyline, I was the BSU president. Um, I'm now at Chabot Community College. I work with Kingmakers of Oakland as their media assistant. 
Um, I was a Bank of America student leader class of 2018 during that summertime. And now I'm also an Oakland Promise ambassador. So I have a lot of different hats that I wear. Um, first, I want to start by thanking all of the students who are present and who are sharing their voices. I want to say I'm very disappointed that my forehead is kind of shining brighter than my whole summer has. Um, but uh, I can't see my slides. I'm going to go over some of the statistics. Here we go. Um, the statistics about the state of the youth and what are some things that the students have been experiencing? What is our city looking like and what we need the leadership to do um, just to support the youth at this time? So if we can go to the next slide. So as you can see here, where we have the statistics for um, unaccompanied and trans transition age of youth. Um, at this, so the total number of unaccompanied and transition age youth um, has been from 82% unsheltered youth um, out of 50 individuals and out of 556 individuals, 71% um, have been unaccompanied transition youth. So these are youth that don't have a place to stay, maybe they're couch surfing, um, but these are people who are in our communities and in our city who don't have a place to say, stay. So how can we talk about public safety um, when there are people who are living under bridges and people who don't actually have a safe location for them to go to? If you go to the next slide, please. Um, here we have the, et the ethnic makeup of OUSD unhoused youth. There is an alarming rate of youth who are Latino who um, make up the um, the unhoused youth and then following right after them is the African American community. So almost 700 on this graph here is of the Latino youth who are um, unhoused and we have almost a, um, an amount of 300 people who are African American who are also unhoused. So we're talking about the, um, how diverse our community is and how we want equity for all of our students. We have unhoused Latino and African American students. So. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what can we do with the city's leadership to make sure that our youth um, actually have a safe place to go when they're not on campus. Next slide, please. So the youth poverty in Bay Area. There, there's a lot of information going on here. I'm gonna give you your chance to look at this. Um, these slides will be shared with you and um, this Zoom is being recorded. But as you can see here, um, the youth poverty within the Bay Area, if we just look at San Francisco, right across the bridge, we have, oh Lord, I can't see. I might need glasses soon. Let's say, Calif so for California, 23%. Um, and on the bottom, the percent of students eligible to receive fee or reduced price lunches for California is 39%. So we're looking at the poverty rates for the youth in the Bay Area. How many youth are meeting that rate? How many of the people um, don't qualify for some of the services? Um, or they do qualify, but there's not enough money to be given to them. So this is a question about the equity and where is the money being allocated um, and just how are we providing more services for our youth? Next slide, please. So suspension rates. We know that this is a big issue in our community. Um, we've actually been fined before in the past um, for having an, a large amount of African-American and Latino boys being suspended. Here from 2017 to 2018, there's a 3.9% of students with one or more out of school suspensions. So if you're suspended, you're not in class, you're not learning, and you're not meeting your graduation requirements, so you're at risk of not walking that stage, not getting that diploma. And we know that now you don't even, you need more than just a diploma to qualify for a good job, right? Or to go to college. So if students are being suspended, they're not getting that education, um, they're gonna end up somewhere where they probably don't want to be, somewhere that they probably shouldn't be. Um, and now we're losing our youth, right? And then there are, our youth aren't coming, becoming successful adults who are going to come back to our community. We have a total of 10.8% of African-American males who were suspended from schools or had um, in-school suspensions. So how are we serving our African-American youth and how are we making sure that they get the education they need to be successful? Next slide, please. So in June of 2020, OUSD adopted the George Floyd resolution to eliminate the Oakland schools, um, school district's police department. This is a huge win. Please clap it up for OUSD for doing this work. Um, I know when I was in school, watching the cops walk up and down the campus with their guns didn't make me feel safe. I couldn't focus when I was in class. So I'm glad that they're eliminating the budget for the uh, school district's police department. 
but where is this money going? If there's no longer money for police department, how are we allocating those funds to support the student services? How are we you know, funding restorative justice, which has been proven to reduce the suspension rates of African-American and Latino boys in schools? How are we funding these services and how are youth being put on the, um, at the table and not on the menu? Next slide, please. And so we know that this COVID thing, we've been swept up. We haven't really had a summertime. A lot of people have been, been at the lake. Ever since Barbecue Becky had been, so many people have been having barbecues at the lake, but now is not the time to be partying and to be having fun um, because the COVID is spiking. We are having more um, tests coming in and now even the youth are being affected. Um, we are also susceptible to getting COVID-19. So please just give the lake a break. Kind of try and spend a little time away from the lake. Uh, maybe you can go to the Berkeley Marina, um, but there's just too much pollution happening. People are throwing their masks into the water. Um, and there's just so much um, negative opportunity for people to get sick and to get infected with um, COVID-19. Um, so please try and limit how much time you spend at the lake. Try and you know find some other outdoor activities that don't involve you going around crowds. Um, and then for our city's leadership, again, how are we going to bring bright futures to our youth and just make sure they get the support um, that they need? And so now we're going to go over some of our demands. I'm going to give the mic to uh, King Trade Germany and Mr. Azil Farah. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. My name is Berlin Trade Germany. I'm a recent 2020 graduate of MetWest High School. I'm representative of Team Makers of Open African American Male Achievement and a recipient of the Open Promise Scholarship. These two demands go out to our people in power, specifically uh, Libby Schaaf and Kyla Johnson Trammell. As students, we want a cultural change in Oakland and Oakland schools. We want to adapt and implement the restorative justice, youth outreach, and inclusion approach. More teachers should learn how to begin school and classes with circles. Superintendent Kyla, do you pledge to help change the culture in OUSD and Oakland broadly by working to train more teachers through the Teacher Institute and other professional development opportunities with restorative justice training? We also want transparency with Oh no, it looks like Trey's might have um, froze. Is that correct? Did Trey just freeze? Yes, it looks like he did just freeze. Okay, um, as we try and get him back, a seal. do you think you can pick up where he left off? Within the budget and how our money is being spent. Hey, yeah, Trey, Jeremy? froze on us. Do you think you can repeat the ask for Superintendent Johnson Trammell? Yes. Thank you. So, so we want transparency, engagement, and partnership. Now that the police is being removed from OUSD and the city of Oakland is funding community mental health responders through MACRO, do you commit to share with us, communicate with us, and with other Oakland youth exactly where the funding is going? Engage us youth in funding decisions and the next steps for OUSD and MACRO as we continue to move forward. Thank you uh, so much, Trey. My name is Asil Farah and I am uh, representing the Yemeni American uh, Center, Youth Center, as a youth leader. And I consider myself to be a, a human rights activist and we want investment. Do you pledge to hustle and find additional resources at the state level and privately to invest in programs that support youth, such as art programs, uh, restorative justice programs, after school programs, reading programs, programs that support financial literacy or learning about policies and how to be engaged in their communities. We want policy change. Do you pledge to continue working on laws that will help decriminalize mental illness and drugs? These two things are incarcerating people and we need you to work on laws and policies that show your commitment to education, not cutting the budget or shutting down schools and making a commitment to, to show that fully funding education is important and giving our requests. I wanna hear your response, superintendent. We are passing it off to you. Sure, thank you, Azil, and all the students who've had um, an opportunity to speak um, from Nicholas, who I see at the top of my screen, who started us off in song, um, to all of you who presented um, research 
um, just some of the fundamental root causes of what causes um, kind of the participation in our prison incarceration um, numbers. I would encourage you all to add literacy rates as well um, because uh, the amount of illiteracy in our prison systems and so the number of students who are leaving schools across the nation um, is a huge indicator of who actually ends up in our incarceration system as well. Um, I was jotting down notes just in terms of some of the investments and I want to um, be very clear that we actually haven't made any decisions yet about the investments because that actually is a part of the stakeholder conversation. So for all of you who have had the opportunity to read the resolution, um, the transition to our alternative way and how we're reimagining safety uh, begins in uh, January or December 30th, 2020, which gives us um, towards the end of August, that is when we are planning to launch the, the stakeholder um, conversations and absolutely youth will be included. Um, Community-based organizations will be included. Um, we have a meeting coming up with BOP actually in a couple of weeks. Various folks within our, our school communities will be included as well. So it's going to be a robust, diverse group of folks wrestling with all of the different issues um, that cause our schools to be unsafe and all of the different feedback we've heard all along the way. Investments in mental health, student leadership, teacher training. Um, how are we gonna deal with issues that happen outside of the actual school um, that sometimes make their way onto campus? So there's a lot to consider um, and it's gonna be those recommendations that are gonna help us figure out how we're repurposing um, what we were spending um, on our sworn officers. Um, in terms of laws and policies, um, I've been hustling since the first day I have been in this position. Um, and I think it's important to note that pretty much all of the services that we currently have, um, even with the budget constraints that we have had in Oakland, um, and across the state. All of the work that we have had in restorative justice, our community school managers, our community health centers, our early literacy program, um, being able to augment some of the counselors that we have, um, our pathways work, um, our middle school investments, all of that is actually grant funded, whether it's through federal grants, state grants, um, or just local giving from our foundations. Um, and so that is constant work of being out there. Uh, last week, I just spent two hours on call with Republican and Democratic senators talking specifically about the impact of COVID in Oakland, um, not to just lift up the issues in Oakland, but pretty much any urban um, district, whether you're talking about Philly or Detroit or Baltimore, just getting people um, who actually make decisions in terms of some of the federal money, which every public school system at this point is going to need for them to understand what is happening on the ground. Whether we're talking about food, we haven't stopped any of our food distribution, even though we're not getting paid for that. Um, all of the technology work that, that we're doing now that really should be coming from the federal government. I have been in many conversations um, talking about how technology is a right, just like water and electricity. You cannot really be um, a productive member of society in the 21st century if you don't have a device and hotspots. So we are doing a lot of hustling and putting what we have together with generous donations. But the bottom line is that should be funding that every school district has period. We shouldn't be having to do all of this. So I'm just giving you those examples in terms of work that's already being done um, and that will continue to be done in terms of funding that we need, um, but also policies at the state level um, and the federal level um, to address many of the issues. Uh, I was on a webinar two weeks ago talking about mental health and the reform that we actually need in our state in terms of the funding um, that we need. So that mental health support is at every single school. 
So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I, I really like the, the structure of this forum. Um, I think it's important to continue to educate, um, particularly as youth in terms of what you all feel are some of the most strategic investments that you really think um, help you in terms of your education academically, in terms of your supports um, to get to college and mental health. Um, so that's definitely an area where I would like to continue to partner um, in the future. We had success, um, even with all of our challenging budget times, um, which will still continue until California is a better funded state, which we are not yet. We still got to work on that. Um, we've had success when we've partnered together to really state our case in terms of what the need is, um, because there are resources in the Bay Area. We just need to continue. I love that word hustle because that's a lot of what we're going to have to continue to do. Thank you, Superintendent Tr Tramel. Um, Mayor Libby Schaff, would you like a chance to reply to these as well? Sure. Um, first of all, this has been an amazing um, hour or so of inspiration, of talent, the music, the testimony. Thank you. What a gift. And, and frankly, um, you know, even as leaders, we are human beings, and these have been some of the most challenging times. This, this epidemic, this this pandemic, the the economic impact, uh, the the civil unrest, the the absolute horrific miscarriage of justice, the murder of George Floyd. It's a lot. And um, I just want to speak personally that you have really lifted me up in this um, time together. So thank you for that gift. Um, I absolutely am excited to accept your challenge to, to reply to your demands. Um, I want to propose to you some ideas that I have about how to do that. Um, for those of you who don't know, you know, my name is Libby Schaff. I'm born and raised in Oakland. Like, like my partner, Kyla Johnson Trammell, your superintendent, I'm a very proud graduate of Skyline High School, class of 83. Um, I always say that every Oakland girl has a side hustle and I love other people's money. So your, your demand about hustling more resources speaks to my heart. Um, and and I, I know that what you're asking for is change. You don't wanna hear about what we've done in the past. You wanna hear what we're gonna do for you in the future. But I do wanna say like I have been out, I have hustled $70 million for the Oakland Promise. Uh, some of you might not know, I hustled to help actually found Lighthouse Charter School. Um, I have hustled with Kyla in partnership with so many, $13 million to get laptops and hot hot spots into the homes of, of every Oakland public school student so they can do distance learning like I love to hustle. So I'm excited about that. I think the biggest hustle that we all can do together is there is a measure on this November ballot. It's called Prop 15. It's known as, it's known as schools and communities first because there is no amount of fundraising that any of us can do that would be as powerful as changing, as closing a loophole for corporate property owners. And this would lift up the whole state of California. You might not be old enough to vote, but you are old enough to work on a campaign. I can tell you a lot of youth worked on my campaign. That is how I got elected mayor. 
That means you can call people, you can put the word out on social media, you can learn about this campaign and convince people to go vote for it in November, even if you are not old enough to vote for it yourself. And the beauty of getting involved with this campaign or any other campaign that you feel passionate about is I can tell you, you are the future leaders of our city. And by getting involved in a campaign today, you're going to know how to run your own campaign when you become the mayor in the future. And I look forward to voting for you. So I am excited. Uh, you know, can't do it during my government time, but on my, my political time, I would be excited to connect some of you to this campaign. I mean, just an example for the city of Oakland, it would this this if this passes prop 15 on the california ballot for just the city of oakland's budget it would mean 60 million dollars a year every year more for city services and uh, maybe kyla knows the number for ousd uh it is game changing um so the other thing that that when we think about resources is uh president trump gave a trillion dollar tax cut to the wealthiest individuals and corporations. So elections matter. So I really encourage people to get involved because this is a rare moment this November, we have an opportunity to put some leadership in the in the federal government, because they control the vast amount of government resources. So that is something I'm excited about. The other thing that I really heard you talk about uh, is culture change and transparency. And what I would love to um, ask of, of you all is, is you know how to create transparency in the youth. We don't always speak your language or know the, the, the platforms you're on. And so uh, I have talked to my staff and tonight we are excited to announce uh, a, a youth communications fellowship we will pay a stipend for that person, and we will ask that person to also recruit youth communication ambassadors. And I, we will ask you to help us create that transparency and do it in a way that youth can, can actually access and understand to help us translate our bureaucratic political language. Um, and so uh, I've asked my team to post on the chat an email so people who are interested in applying uh, or also helping us promote the opportunity for our youth communications fellow which would be a paid uh, stipended position as well as the ambassador so we can get the word out because i think that's what's going to create transparency is not me just sending out more you know mayor newsletters or holding press conferences but for you to actually run the communications that creates that transparency. Um, that, that is some of the stuff that I'm really excited about. Um, and I hope that those are two very concrete um, commitments. Uh, I will just say a personal thing about restorative justice. I had just become the mayor when Ferguson happened. And I cannot tell you how grateful I am to our joy to restorative justice for Oakland youth. Uh, they organized um, for me youth led uh, restorative justice circles with more than 100 youth over 100 days. And so I uh, have had the incredible, powerful experience of sitting in circle. Uh, and so I am thrilled to uh, continue my commitment to that practice. Uh, the superintendent can tell you that when that program was potentially facing some budget cuts, the city of Oakland actually took money out of our budget and gave it to the school district specifically to keep restorative justice whole, even in these very difficult financial times. So that is a very personal commitment for me. I'm excited to um, hear your ideas about how I can help you hustle. Um, and, uh, you know, I always say, I, like I said, no one knows how to hustle like an Oakland girl. So uh, with that, I'm excited to hear what other questions have come in. Thank you for allowing us to hear you, to enjoy your talent. I love what Rashawn said. 
every student has the light. And I just tell you, I see so much light in each and every one of you, each and every student, each and every young person that I have ever seen in Oakland, I see so much light. So please, um, we are here as your allies to help that light shine. So thank you again. And I'm very excited about the continued conversation and any questions we've gotten. I turn thank it you, back over to the host. <laughs> yes, thank you, Madam Mayor and Superintendent Johnson Tramiel. Um, at this time, I would like to transition this to the Chief of Violence Prevention, uh, Guillermo Sabetis. Hello, um, thank you. Yes, my name is Guillermo Cespedes. And um, first of all, um, thank you for your presentation, for your work on behalf of the city. Um, I don't wanna go on and on about how amazing you are, but you really are amazing. And the, the level of leadership that you bring to the city, it is just enormous. From the perspective of the Vi Department of Violence Prevention, we definitely need your help. We need your counsel. We need your presence, um, not just in the, the activities that you mentioned, um, meaning a discussion around the macro project and your advice and your counsel as to what's going to be done when those calls involve the youth. Um, also about a, around advocating for um, some of the work of training teachers. Um, and really training, um, supporting you. Most of the work that I've seen in Oakland schools, it's, it's really driven by the youth. So the specific questions that, they, that you set forth, I don't see them as a challenge. I see them as a, you know, as a offer to help the city and to help the Department of Violence Prevention. I think we're gonna have to kind of formalize um, a working group that works for the Department of Violence Prevention because there are certain things coming up that are really important. One, there is a work group that's being put together. It's, it's been called a task force. Some people don't like that name, but anyway, it's a work group that is going to um, reimagine uh, public safety in Oakland. And I think we need representation um, from from the youth in, in, that, in that task force. Um, obviously, I don't run the task force, but I am willing to advocate. I think it's clearly very important that you all participate in that. Second thing is the Department of Violence Prevention does need a, um, a youth uh, advisory group that to make sure that we are implementing things that are not just informed by the broader community, but it really truly has a youth perspective. Um, so that's something that we need to follow up on. I think the mayor already spoke about all the hustling that the mayor is willing to do. And um, of course, I will sign up for whatever hustling needs to be done because I do really believe that this is not a challenge. You're not challenging us. You're basically presenting a, um, a helping hand to the city of Oakland and, um, and we need to accept that. So, um, if you have more questions for me, I'm more than willing to answer. I think we do need to put a group together that meets without cameras so that we could have true um, advice from you, um, critical advice from you. Um, so let's do that. Um, so we'll start with putting together a small group that will save us and serve as an advisory body. And um, we need to discuss macro, we need to discuss resources. Uh, there have been some proposals put forth that are being considered now to invest, to divest from police, from school police, to invest in the programs that, that you have discussed. We are very much supporting that and we will continue to support it. Um, but our voice gets a little bit louder if we can work together. So, um, Transparency, um, you, we, need, we need help with that. So, because it's not that anybody's intentionally not being transparent, but we need to be able to look at the world through your eyes. Your presentation was phenomenal. 
the presentation was really off the book. It was phenomenal. And um, I'm hoping that that presentation continues to be replayed in, in different, different forums. Um, I don't know what else I can say to just, you know, just big props, great work. Questions for me from you guys. Um, questions? Uh, as you said, Mr. Sabetis, uh, we look forward to meeting with you when the cameras aren't rolling um, to have those deep conversations about what needs to happen next. Yeah, a little bit less time limited, a little bit more open, a little bit more critical, um, a little bit taking me to task a little bit more. Exactly. Um, because I, you know, it's going to be in person as well. This yes, comes yes. along the way. Um, and, um, Does everyone know what macro actually is? Does everyone know that what that term stands for? No, please enlighten us. Can I take a guess what it stands for? What I want, I want yes, but I and and don't let me answer. You all should answer, and then uh, Chief Suspeta should answer. I'm guessing that it stands for like on a large scale. I remember um, at my high school, they said there was a class macroeconomics, learning about economics on like a worldly scale. So that's what I'm kind of assuming. Yeah. Well, this is a little bit embarrassing. We get so many um, abbreviations mm -hmm. that uh, I for one can't keep track of them, but I can tell you what macro is. Mm -hmm. It's the mobile unit that will respond to mental health issues in particular parts of the city it is being piloted, it's being field tested. And what it's going to do is it is going to um, replace when there's a mental health issue, normally we call the police. This will deploy um, professionally trained mental health workers to respond to mental health issues. The part that we don't have clear yet, and this is why we need to work together, is what happens when that call is about a youth a younger person having a mental health issue. Do we still deploy the same team? Um, I think macro does need your counsel as we pull it together as to how we respond to the crisis of mental health issues among younger people. You all spoke a little bit about adolescent brain development and in some places across the country, the entire police departments are being trained in adolescent brain development to avoid making the mistakes that sometimes school systems make in pushing people out of school. So uh, I'm, I cannot tell you the, the meaning of each letter, but that is the function, the operation of macro. Um, make sense? Yeah, questions yeah. about that? Um, well, I think we are running out of time. We will have to move forward um, with our agenda. I definitely wanna know the age limits for macro, I know with um, Oh, we have an answer. So macro, the mobile assistance community responders of yes. Oakland. Definitely. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I really, oh, I'm sorry, am I cutting you off? No, 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 go ahead. All right, yes, I think that's very important, especially with so much tension happening due to this COVID, people are mentally and emotionally being affected by this. And so I'm glad to see that there's work being done to support people. You know, a couple months ago, I witnessed some people having their own mental things. So um, yes, definitely, thank you. Um, and we look forward again to have to speaking with you again. We look forward to having more meetings with Madam Mayor. It looks like our superintendent had to get off. Um, but now we're going to transition to our next speaker who has some preset questions. So, Asiya, would you like to introduce our next speaker for us? Asiya, could you hear me? Can you hear me, Asil? If not, okay. So our next speaker with who has some pre-submitted questions for the um, for this panel is Ms. Ashley or Alana. So if Ashley or Alana is on, please unmute yourself and share with us the pre-submitted questions. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, first off, thank you, Mary Libby Schaaf, Superintendent 
um, Kyla Chamel, who had to leave, unfortunately, um, Chief Guillermo Cespedes, and thank you to all the wonderful youth that are speaking out today and empowering each other. Hi, my name is Ashley Orellana. I was born and raised in um, East Oakland. I graduated from Oakland Military Institute, so OMI. Um, I'm actually um, an intern at the mayor's office, and I used to be one of the RJ youth. In fact, I remember a lot of the times where I was trying to get into RJ and just trying to seek someone to speak to, and I was um, stopped by security guards for some reason. Now looking back, it seems like it was a privilege to have that RJ um, on my campus. So, so many youth feel strongly about these issues, and that's why I'm here tonight to read out all the questions you submitted live during this town hall. I'm especially going to focus on the ones that are relevant to tonight's topic, which is alternatives to school to prison pipeline. These are open to any of the youth leaders. So if you see this, um, these questions apply to you or adult leaders, please feel free to unmute yourself and answer them for us. So the first one here, I personally saw this one, um, the how many students are enrolled in the Oakland Promise. And I feel like that should be answered. So if anybody could. I think it's about 20,000, but I think I saw Mia Bamita, who is the CEO or executive director of the Oakland Promise on the line. Are you, are you here, Mia? Uh, I'm not, I'm not hearing her, but jump in. I am. Um, oh, good, good. Yes. Um, I'm pretty sure it's 20,000. You're right about right that number. Yeah. That's 20,000 across a lot of different programs. Um, but right now we have actually 1,800 uh, scholars, Oakland Promise scholars, who are uh, receiving the Oakland Promise scholarship, mentoring, and opportunities in in their post-secondary world. So it's 20,000 across the whole entire uh, different components of our program. This is super exciting to I'm super exciting to see all these wonderful faces and um, your commitment and your voice. Uh, this has been a project uh, that Oakland Promise is really excited to support. And we're looking forward to actually doing more youth town halls um, in this venue. This is really powerful. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Um, so could we maybe scroll um, and see other questions that we have? Um, are these the live ones? We would like to see the live ones that are pulled up through, that have been submitted through the course of the town hall. Okay. Okay, um, I'll take this one. Teachers, not schools or districts, need to be audited based off percentage of referrals they write for students of color. Um, this person is a teacher who has taught in the OUSD and FUSD. There is a disproportionate amount of Black and Hispanic students who are being kicked out of class. Is there anything anybody would like to say about that? Any comments? On because that's that's probably a question for them. W one thing that I'll add that's not that, that's related to this question, we believe that Oakland Unified needs more teachers of color, uh, more teachers of color uh, who also are teaching in some of the hard to recruit subjects like STEM and special ed, uh, and that, that they need to be supported to also stay at a school site for like five years. We've seen a huge turnover. So my, my latest hustle is um, we are uh, trying to design a pilot to provide um, stu uh, teacher residents in those areas who are teachers of color with five years of guaranteed affordable housing. Because I saw another question earlier that talked about how expensive it is to live here. So um, I'm not, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to directly um, answer your question about how um, the teacher uh, write-ups are monitored, but I just wanna recognize that, that not enough teachers of color, too much teacher turnover uh, are definite issues in OUSD and the mayor's office is trying to partner with the district to solve that. You're on mute, we can't hear you. Sorry. 
Um, I wanted to thank them thank for answering the questions. Uh, the next question I wanted to direct to the youth that I have presented here today. Um, can you scroll back up? I saw one that maybe. So this one, what topics? So for the youth that are here today who presented, um, what topics do you find the hardest to share with adults around you or even your friends? And how do you wish your parents would talk to you about them? Or um, I just want to know if personally, um, if RJ, I want to add to this question, if RJ kind of helped with that as well, or if you feel kind of uncomfortable with some of the things that um, you want to share with RJ or these um, resources that you have in schools. Well, for me personally, um, at my school, we don't have a huge, I go to Bishop Dad, and we don't have a large number of black teachers. And um, we usually, we have two of them. And as a black student, you're almost kind of assumed to have some, some form of connection with them just because you guys both look like each other. And um, I feel like it's hardest to share with some of them, like my experience, like going to other public schools kinda, because they come from like a religious school system, like Catholic school. And so I just have a trouble, I have trouble sharing with them sometimes like about my experiences or who I am. I feel like I kind of have to be filtered since I'm at a private school a little bit. And I don't know if I'm kind of getting a little bit mixed up with the question, but that's kind of what I have trouble sharing with them is like my personal experience. I feel like I have to kind of be filtered and that's a little bit hard, but this is specifically in the private school system, but it's still in Oakland. So I still feel like it relates. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, definitely. So what topics do you find the hardest to share with adults around you or even friends? I wanted to include RJ as well. Um, or how do you wish your parents would talk to you about them or um, the programs that you have available to you? I think personally, um, when I was in high school, even out of high school, being that I'm only 18, I'm still looked at as a youth and treated as a youth. And the difficulty with navigating this world when you have a mature mindset is that the people will treat you as a youth and won't give you the voice, they won't give you the opportunity to voice how you feel or voice your opinions. And when you discredit the youth's voice, you also diminish their um, willingness to share. And you're like destroying their spirit when they feel comfortable sharing with you. And so one of the difficulties that I had was being able to speak with adults um, because I felt like they were gonna discard me and they, were, they weren't gonna listen. And I'm very vocal, but if I feel like I'm being disrespected, I will, I will remove myself from that environment. And it's hard for a youth to remove themselves from the school environment when they're supposed to be in school to be educated and they have to learn, right? Um, which is why I think a lot of students um, are skipping class or are caught out of class or intentionally get themselves suspended, but we're doing a huge disservice. What I enjoyed about RJ is that I could be in the wrong, but I was able to have a conversation with an adult or with a peer who understood where I was coming from and they listened to me and to understand, not to punish me. Um, I, I sought out RJ when I was in school because I, I was afraid that I was gonna get in trouble for something I didn't do. I was accused of doing something I didn't do. So I went to an RJ uh, representative. They didn't say, well, I don't believe you because all these adults say you did it. They said, well, what's your side of the story? How did it make you feel when this happened? And how can we move forward so that you can be your best self when you're in class? And so um, uh, I definitely just think that I want more adults to treat the youth with respect and more as peers versus as the 16, 17, 18 year olds that they have running around um, because that's just, just diminishing our ability to be present with the person we're speaking to. Can you guys add something in? Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say I think another topic with my peers is the school to prison pipeline. I feel like a lot of my black male friends around me um, are unaware that the system is set up for them to fail almost, and so they kind of go along with it. They want to do whatever their friends are doing, and they don't realize that <clears throat> it's against them, and they have to sometimes avoid certain things in order to be successful. Um, and I feel like it also ties into like knowing your roots, knowing your history, knowing about yourself, and wanting to seek that education and keep going forward. And a lot of them don't have really that drive around them, so I feel like it's kind of hard to talk to them about it. And so, like you said, different programs that they could be involved 
involved with that uh, I remember Soraya was talking about it earlier um, are really important and that could really help them. Thank you so much for including the school to prison pipeline. We didn't have um, enough time for those type of questions. Um, but now I'm going to pass it off to Vita to close us out. Okay, I was I was muted. Sorry. Um, thank you, Ashley, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. My name is Vida Mendoza. I am a, I'm the vice president of Oakland's All City Council and an incoming freshman at Life Academy. As we close this event today, I want us all to take some time to know why we were gathered. Change. A change needs to be made in our community. Our youth are being criminalized and fear is being enforced in our streets. Today, we, ha we talked about demands we have and alternatives to policing. The youth are fighting for a change, but we need people to help us stretch our voices to every corner of our community. <laughs> to create a change, we must work together. So use the information you received here today to ensure a better future for our society. With that being said, I want to thank everybody for attending this town hall and showing your support. I also want to thank the youth leaders and the organizations that helped plan this event. Thank you all.